And now, John Doerr, Ryan Pachatsaram with Dieter Holger of The Wall Street Journal. Welcome to our audience here in Miami and online around the world. My name is Dieter Holger with The Wall Street Journal. We're joined here with John Doerr and Ryan Panchan Saram of Kleiner Perkins. Last year, amid the climate negotiations in Glasgow, they published Speed and Scale, a book that provides a blueprint of how to get to net zero. Let's start off laying out the action plan you put together in your book, Speed and Scale, specifically what you call objectives, results, and accelerants to get the world there. John, maybe you want to start off and then Ryan can come in. We can do that. <laughs> uh, all of you should have a copy of this book, or there's one outside this auditorium. And it's not really a book. It's a plan. And the way it came to be is a while ago, I was watching Al Gore's seminal movie, An Inconvenient Truth. And after we saw it, my family came home for dinner, and I asked my friends and two daughters what they thought. We kind of went around the table, and my, the conversation came to my 16-year-old daughter, Mary. And she, she looked at me and she said, Dad, I'm scared and I'm angry. Your generation created this problem. You better fix it. So. <clears throat> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I set out with my partners to learn as much as I could about this climate crisis. And over the course of a few years, we invested in 70 early stage breakthrough companies to try to solve the problem. Um, but as we worked on this, what I realized was there's a lot of goals for climate change. What the world needs is a plan. Not necessarily the best plan, but just one plan that's scientifically based, where the numbers all add up. And it shows us a way to meet my daughter's challenge, to get us to net zero by 2050 and halfway there by 2030. And so that's what speed and scale is. It's a plan to get us to net zero by 2050. There are six big elements of this plan. I'd like to show them to you. They are the places where we can reduce emissions by some 59 gigatons. There are simply, one, to electrify our transportation, use electric cars and trucks. Second, to decarbonize our grid. That's to generate our electricity from wind and solar and safe nuclear. Third, to fix our food systems. That includes reducing voluntarily the amount of beef that we eat, but also how we grow our food and how much of our food's wasted. 35% of the food in the world is wasted. A fourth major step is to protect nature. And by that, I mean our rainforests, our sea forests, our peatlands. That's a source of great emissions reduction. Fifth, we must clean up industry. That's how we make our concrete and our steel. We've got to find ways to do that with less, indeed, with zero carbon. And speaking of carbon, if we're successful in our plan with those first five, there's still going to be 10 of those 59 gigatons that I call the stubborn carbon that we've got to remove by mechanical or other growing new forest kinds of means. Now, that's the plan, six big hairy ass objectives. <laughs> Each of them is a monumental effort in its own right, and we've got to do them all at the same time. Even worse than that, we've got to do this rapidly. Ryan? And so John shared the first part of the plan, right? How to go from 59 to zero. But we've got to get there faster. And so what we have in the book is we call these accelerants. Uh, there are four of them. Aha, here we are. These four accelerants are the things that you and I can do to get us to that net zero future by 2050 and halfway by 2030. And so what we've got to do is win the policy and politics, right? These are actually passing the laws needed to accelerate this transition. It's about turning movements into action from the ballot box to the boardroom, 
getting companies to make net zero commitments, getting people elected that take climate seriously. It's also about innovation, which is driving down the cost of technologies. And then the fourth accelerant we can pull on is called investment, right? This transition needs more R&D dollars, it needs more venture capital, and it also needs more project financing. So everyone's bag has a copy of this poster. This is it. It's a plan. You can get it for free. It's on the website <laughs> Speed and Scale, speedandscale.com. You can download it. On one side, you have these 10 big, Jim Collins would say this, hairy ass objectives. But what's wonderful, what's magical about the plan is those 10 objectives then become 55 detailed, <laughs> measurable time. I mean, this is an engineer's delight. <laughs> That, that shows the gigatons that can be removed, and it lets us track our progress against these. Ryan, do you want to give a couple of examples? Yeah, I'm going to give one example. So each of these objectives is paired up with a set of key results. And so we're nerdy engineers that took objectives and key results, and we applied it to the climate crisis, and this is what you get. You get KRs, key results like this, KR 1.1, which is that the cost of electric vehicles needs to be cheaper than its fossil fuel equivalent. If in, by 2024, it isn't cheaper, we can't expect people to switch to EVs. Or take the key result around buses. By 2025, every city should be purchasing electric buses or hydrogen buses. If a new diesel bus goes on the road, we know we're off track. And so that's the plan, all in a nutshell, presented as 10 objectives and 55 key results. Dieter. Thank you very much. Not to belager the point, because it was obviously an emotional moment for you, John, but you started off the book with how angry your daughter was, then 15 at the time, after that viewing of Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. She accused your generation of helping create the environmental problems we face. Do you expect your generation to address the problem? And how optimistic are you about getting to net zero? So we're making remarkable progress. The cost of wind and solar has plummeted. It's now cheaper to put up renewable energy than new dirty fossil fuel coal burning fired power plants. But the rate of our improvement is not keeping pace. We're not gaining ground on the problem. The most recent IPCC report said, we're out of time. There's, there's no more time left to, to spare. We, we've got to achieve these key results to have a reasonable chance of delivering one and a half degrees increase Celsius in temperature by 2050, and even more demanding to get halfway there in terms of emission reductions by 2030. So I would, we, we, we talked about this recently, the, the, the family. Uh, they're still angry, and what I say to them is it's gonna be up to them and us together if we're to solve this problem. Let's turn to the past as we look to the future. There was an ill-fated venture boom in clean tech earlier on in the 21st century. Following that, Kleiner Perkins' investments in clean tech have cooled, though you have set up a separate firm called G2VP that's focused on sustainability. What lessons have you learned from these failed investments that we can apply now to make sure we meet the objective of net zero? Ryan, could you start and then we could move to John, please. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I get the, uh, I've had the fortunate ability to work with John for the past five years and around the Kleiner team. And they learned a world of uh, lessons from that early first deployment. But I think the one number to kind of look at is the, this concept of performance and the concept of cost, right? I think what's on us as innovators today as we build new companies, the things we build have to actually perform better than the fossil fuel equivalent. Because when, when you do, you start to win, right? It's why people are picking EVs. They're really convenient to charge at home. It's why people are putting their solar and storage on their homes in California and Texas, because it creates resilience. But also cost was an important factor as well too, Dieter. This whole idea of the green premium that Gates you know, coined. If the green thing is more expensive, right? Remember that KR around price for cars? People aren't gonna switch. But as soon as that green premium gets to zero, and then becomes negative, that's a green discount, and markets love that. So over uh, about seven years, we invested a billion dollars, this is in the book, in some 70 different climate startups. Eight of them made solar stuff and panels. One of them was Fisker. I should have invested in Tesla, but those billion dollars 
of investment, worst decision I made. <laughs> that billion dollars of invested at the time of the book's writing was worth three billion. So it wasn't a write-off, mm. but there's some really important lessons that have been learned in an ever-growing community. First of all, you gotta be ruthless about getting your risks up front and out of the way early. Second, you are always raising money. It takes more time, it takes more money to build these climate tech ventures. Third, as Ryan suggested, the costs are king. You've gotta take all your innovation and devote it to lowering the cost because consumers don't wanna pay any more for something green. It's gotta be green and cost competitive. Fourth, the incumbents are gonna fight back at you and they will fight dirty. Mm -hmm. The book is full of stories about that. Fifth and finally, it takes patience, perseverance, and uncommonly an incredible sense of urgency to win in this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Winning politics and policy is also part of your book. We are about to hear from Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Other politicians are gathering here in Miami. Um, but of course, the IPCC, that's the pivotal UN bellwether report on climate change, over and over named that corporate lobbying is a major obstruction to climate action. So specifically here in the United States, what needs to change politically if net zero is gonna be accomplished? John, could you start and then we can go to Ryan, please. Well, uh, there's two of these big goals that deal with politics. One is winning the politics and policy. The other equally important one is how do we turn movements into action? And so I wanna read you one of the key results. Key result 8.1. The climate crisis needs to be a top two voting issue in the 20 top emitting countries by 2025. Now you'll remember in 2018, Greta Thunberg was a lone Swedish teenager striking from school in front of parliament on Fridays by herself. By 2019, she'd organized a million youth in 100 cities around the world in one of the most successful demonstrations ever that the adults were screwing the kids in their future. But she did something even more important than that. Our surveys show that she took climate and raised its priority from number three or four to a top two issue in seven European nations. Now climate is not a top two issue in the US. It's not a top two issue in China. It's not a top two issue in India. And so I'm counting on the anger and activism of youth to raise this issue because it's very hard for our political leaders to get ahead of their voters. And a counter example we're gonna hear from in just a few minutes. I cannot wait to hear from Nancy Pelosi. She is courageous. She's the most effective politician in, in my judgment that we have in Washington, D.C. And she is determined to get climate legislation through the United States, in spite of the fact that it's not a top two voting issue today. Thank you, John. Ryan, do you have anything to add there, particularly around lobbying? And we know that uh, for politicians, climate change isn't a top fundraising issue either. You know how, how John said, the, the incumbents are gonna fight, right? They're gonna fight tooth and nail to keep their revenue streams alive, right? We talk about that 59 billion tons of emissions. Those emissions are someone else's business model. And so if you want to change the status quo, right, as you can see, John and I are leaning on the other levers. So if the policy and politics aren't working, John talked about leaning on turning movements into action. I'm gonna say as innovators, we have to lean on the technology and actually driving down the costs of it. Because when you do that, it can compete. You can also lean on the investment lever as well too. If you deploy more, cost curves go down. And so when one of the levers is failing, lean on one of the, pull the others effectively. We have to make the right outcome, the profitable outcome. So it's the probable outcome. None of these key results are given. They are all stretched. They are all very ambitious. We will fail at some, we'll exceed others along the way. But we will not get this done if we don't harness the forces of business in the financial markets to take us into this new clean energy economy. Thank you. 
Admittedly, some of us in the media might focus a bit on the negatives around climate change, but there are some positive things as well. I'm hoping we can end our talk today with some of the positive developments you've seen recently, maybe after even these negotiations, these pivotal negotiations in Glasgow. Uh, Ryan, if you'd like to start off, please. Yeah, you know, if we tried to write this book three or four years ago, we wouldn't be able to celebrate the number of companies that are doing great work, from the Beyond Meats, to the Sun Runs, to the End Phases, to the Teslas that are leading on this revolution. If we wrote this book just five years ago, solar and wind was still more expensive. And today, right, when folks walked into Glasgow, it was actually cheaper, right? When you look at the amount of, uh, 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 the amount of people that are finally buying EVs, just three or four years ago, it was barely a percent. And at the end of last year, it finally crossed the 10 to 11% mark. So this momentum is real. The change that we want to see happen is real. But because this is an analog problem and not a digital one, it's going to be very, very hard. John, some positives, please. <laughs> one, I want to tell, talk about some positives that came out of the Glasgow conference, mm -hmm. which Greta dismissed as being more blah, blah, blah. You may remember that. And also some developments post-Glasgow. Uh, more nations of the world updated their plans. The plans are not aggressive enough. Even if we meet the plans, they won't get the job done. But they agreed to come back a year later with even more aggressive plans. There was a bold agreement that we're going to hear from Fred Krupp about on methane. The nations of the world said that methane is a particularly dangerous and potent greenhouse gas. And if we cap the leaks and the flaring of methane, we could lower the rise in temperature by perhaps as much as four-tenths of a degree. So the methane collaboration was very encouraging, though I don't, I don't believe the US quite signed up for some political reasons. Don't ask me. I would need to Google that. <laughs> I, I'd have to Google that one. <laughs> but. I think the coming year will be the year of measurement, and we will see satellites and drones and aircraft providing, like Google Earth, a real-time map of emissions around the world. EDF is putting up its own satellite. Now, there was a report from the IPCC just within the last 60 days, and it's the one that warned us we must have peak emissions before 2025 to get to a 50-50 chance of one and a half degrees C increase. That's going to be very hard to do. But the good news out of that same IPCC report was when we reach true net zero, the temperatures on the planet are going to stop rising in three to four or five years. And if we stay at net zero, half of the emissions that are due to human activity will fall out in 25 to, to 30 years. So there's genuine reasons for hope and fear. What we've got to do is make sure that our fear and anger galvanize us into action. It doesn't paralyze us into despair or giving up. Thank you both, and thank you to our audience. <laughs>